Well, hello, hello. Welcome, everybody. This is the July the 15th, 2021 edition of Southern Fried DNN Meetup. I'm glad everybody's able to join us. We got quite a few people coming into uh, the meeting here. And if you're watching uh, live, thanks for attending. And if you are going to be watching this after the fact, then greetings wherever you are in this fine world. Um, I am kind of pulling triple duty today on this one because uh, Ryan Moore, who typically emcees the, the events here, he is out on a scouting trip. So Ryan, we miss you. And I probably will not do justice to the way that you run these things. So uh, forgive me for that. Um, and Clint Patterson, he's actually involved in a client meeting right now and has a conflict, uh, is una unable to join us here too. So that being said, a little bit of housekeeping. If there are things that uh, are questions while either I'm presenting or uh, actually while Daniel's presenting later on, I'll be monitoring the chat a little bit better. But while I'm presenting, I may or may, may not see your chat. So feel free to just interrupt me as I'm presenting. Um, we usually start out these meetings by uh, thanking our sponsors, and I hopefully I won't forget uh, the right ones here, but we do like to thank Manage.com for hosting the SouthernFriedDNN.com website. Um, main thing that you're going to get out here at this site is every month after the meetups, we do a recap. Uh, Ryan does a great job at writing up the recap, so here's the one from last month where Will Stroll, our awareness leader, I think Will just joined us as well. Hello, Will. Um, presented on being in awareness and Steve Krantzman uh, presented on CK Editor Magic. Um, so you can check out the recaps there and of course watch the YouTube uh, videos that are posted out on the YouTube channel. They're usually embedded into these articles. So um, I think someone will be kind of re-watching this after the fact and doing a recap of this one as well. Um, but you can check out uh, our YouTube channel out there as well, where all of the meetups are posted after the fact. Let's see. Um, we've got also, seems like I'm missing a sponsor here. Um, yep, I can't think of the one that I'm missing right now. Uh, but we have quite a few. Uh, oh, actually, uh, Mandeeps, that's what it is. Uh, Mandeeps, I think we're using the his uh, live blog um, module out here on the website. So they were kind enough to grace us with a license out there. So thanks to them. If you uh, don't know about manage.com or mandeeps.com, check them out and uh, uh, manage.com hosting for DNN websites and uh, manage, I'm sorry, mandeeps uh, for various extensions that work on DNN platform and evoke. Let's get into a little bit of announcements uh, in the community. Um, of course, always be attuned to what's going on out on the dnncommunity.org website. There's a lot of resources out here for you. I've highlighted just a few uh, blogs that have been posted recently uh, out here, and one from Clint Patterson recently uh, that was talking about GitHub sponsors. And if, you know, a lot of you may not know about GitHub sponsors, but it's a great way um, through GitHub to sponsor various developers that are in the community. Um, or, I mean, I guess it doesn't have to be a developer, any contributor of any sort uh, that is contributing to projects. Being able to, they launched a new feature that allows you to do one-time uh, gifts instead of being committed to a monthly uh, gift. When they first launched that program, it was, you kind of had to commit to a monthly contribution. So I think a lot of people didn't, didn't do, uh, didn't leverage that feature because, you know, the, the inability to do it one time and perhaps forgetting to uh, cancel their uh, monthly subscription. Uh, there, but it's great because a lot of sponsors will configure their environment to be able to do an open kind of one-time contribution, but Clint did a nice write-up out here explaining how it works. So if you don't know about that and you're looking to get some things done on your favorite open source project, including DNN platform, um, be sure to check it out. Most of the developers, I think, in our community have sponsor pages out there. 
And uh, you can just check that out. I think you can go to github.com forward slash the username of the developer and sponsors, or I may have that backward. Is it slash sponsors slash the username? It's one of those two. Um, but if you go to their profile page, usually if they have sponsorships configured, you'll be able to get to it right from their main profile page as well. This was another fairly big announcement recently um, that um, thanks to the efforts of a few in our community was able to work with Canteris, who has now donated PolyDeploy uh, to the community. Um, or I should just say really the stewardship of the project has really been turned over. Um, they um, launched this open source project, I think maybe it was like three years ago um, at a DNN summit. And it caught on really great, but it's a solution that allows you to um, install multiple extensions within DNN um, all at one time with only one app pool recycle as a part of the process. And you can do that through a user interface as well as doing that through any kind of continuous integration or continuous delivery tools like GitHub Actions or uh, DevOps. But the project over the years has has evolved a bit. And, you know, it, when a project's this big and, and this complicated, sometimes it's hard for the original company to maintain and, and keep up with it. So they have graciously turned that over to the GitHub um, organization of DNA community. And so the plans here, Mitch Sellers outlines in this article that um, what the plan really is to get that project up to a point to where um, hopefully, ultimately, it can be rolled into the base offering for DNN platform. So that's an exciting one there. So check that one out. Another one recently by Stefan Kampas um, about the CK Editor. So I thought this was a nice segue to last month's meetup about CK Editor when Steve Krantzman uh, presented on so much here. It was a nice uh, article out here about how to use the Im easy image upload uh, in the DNN. CK editor implementation. What other, I guess um, one of the other big ones uh, to announce is the release candidate for DNN platform 9.10.0. Um, you'll see that there is a release candidate two out here now. And there's much to talk about really on this release. I think it's gonna be a great release um, with a, a bunch of nice new things in it. So be sure to check out the release notes out here, as well as get involved in testing uh, for the platform. Uh, you can do that in one of many ways. You can come out to GitHub here, go to the releases and download your install package or upgrade packages, whatever it is that you're, you're testing. Um, you can also do this through MB Quick Site to make that a quick and easy process for you to install locally and test. So thanks to everybody that has contributed. I think there are quite a few contributors for this month and they're listed there. So thanks to all of them uh, for their awesome contributions. What have I missed? Have I missed anything uh, that's worthy of highlighting in the community um, that anybody has that I've missed? Testing, testing, testing. One, two, three. No, I mean, uh, please do test the RC and report any issues. It's Absolutely. a I think very, was very one issue, welcome task. There was one issue that I think got resolved already. Um, uh, yep. in the RC, I think it wouldn't even install. <laughs> so it was yep. kind of a build process. And thanks to Brian Dukes, I was able to get that um, input in. So it, it does pay off to report these issues, um, even if you're not 100% confident of what's causing it still report it because somebody else may know uh, what, what's going on there. You can come out to the issues tab here, click on new issue and uh, post that there. Anything else that anybody would like to uh, point out before we jump into the uh, presentations for today? Anybody working on any really cool little projects or big projects? <laughs> And crickets. Everybody's on vacation. That's right. Uh, man, <laughs> they're following suit after you, Brian, you know, going on holiday yeah. in the summer. 
Well, let's jump into it. Um, today, we've got two presenters, uh, one of which is myself. So this is a bit awkward. I'm going to introduce myself. Hi, uh, me, David Poindexter. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, then later, uh, Daniel Velotis will be talking about ice cream. I think he likes vanilla for some reason. So he's going to tell us why he likes vanilla. Um, but uh, we'll jump right into it. And if something is not coming through or making sense, uh, hopefully my audio is okay here. Um, just let me know. Just chime in. And if you have any questions along the way, just let me know. We'll have a, a, a piece at the end here to, uh, to kind of allow some more questions and deeper dive into some of the subject matter that, that, that you're interested in or want to know more about. Um, but we'll make this pretty open-ended. So um, for those that don't know, there are uh, four primary leaders, I guess, in the, in the DNA community right now. And um, I am one of them. I'm on the strategy side of things. And um, I, my main role kind of in that is to kind of connect the dots between the various leadership groups. So awareness, technology, and development. And I think Will Strolls here uh, today from the awareness group. So thanks for joining us, Will. Um, we, we meet on a regular basis uh, as a leadership team. And there are some, also some sub leaders and other groups there. And I'll go over some of that there a little bit as well. But a little bit more about me. Um, I am the CEO of Envisionative. We are a creative marketing and app development company uh, based out of North Carolina in the US of A. Um, I mentioned I'm on the leadership team and uh, on the strategy, I'm on the board of directors for DNN Connect and co-president of the Southern Fried DNN, which we're in right now. Uh, and you may also know me from some of the other tools that are used within the ecosystem here. It'd be QuickSight and various MV Quick uh, products that are out there, open source products and contact information down there at below. So let's take, a, I, I, I find it very difficult to talk about strategy, you know, without really evaluating our past. And I think a few uh, leaders have done this recently, talking about kind of where we used to be, where we come from, where we've you know, gone through, and uh, kind of where we are now. So I'd like to take a little bit different approach to this and put a little bit of a pictorial uh, journey here together for you. Um, now get through this fairly quickly. We'll get into the meat of things. So when uh, DNN kind of first evolved as .NET Nuke, as we all know it at the time, I think it came out of a I buy spy project um, that was kind of a, a best practices uh, project put together by Microsoft and another company, and, and eventually I buy spy workshop evolved out of that and ultimately became .NET Nuke. Um, Back in the days, it was really kind of the, the great frontier, right? It was, what is this thing called ASP.NET? And how do we use that to build websites and portals back in the time with the terminology and you know have real content management features and things like that? So, I mean, it was like, it was almost like a kid in a candy store. You know, it's like, wow, there's this great land out here that we need to explore and you know, try to figure out what in the world this means for us. And this technology is new and it's cool and fun. And let's just kind of jump out there and really explore. And uh, so it evolved into this real exploration and establishment, you know, thing where there was this group of people and I'd ultimately that kind of kind of became the core team that, that worked on the the solution, and this was back before GitHub, obviously, you know, so um, open source back then meant something a little different than it does now. It's the same concepts, but the actual collaboration of coding and sharing things with each other was, was a little different from a tooling standpoint back then, but it was great, you know, but this, it was this exploration of what does it mean to be a content management system, and what is that, what features does that involve, and like any you know, new products, a lot of times you get you go down the path of a little bit of feature this, feature that, we wanna do this, we wanna do that. And you start getting into a little bit of uh, what can sometimes lead to a feature bloat. And um, 
so we had all the core modules that were involved in the project, you know, like FAQs, want to be able to do an FAQ on the site, want to be able to manage documents on the site, want to be able to manage links, want to be able to have announcements. And, you know, it was really a lot of these different little features and those kind of became sub teams, you know, that would, or individuals that would maintain those modules, you know, within DNN. And I'm kind of sticking high level here, but, you know, you, you get it. It was like, let's figure out this cool new feature and let's implement it and it becomes part of the product. But there was also this thing that was beyond the actual product itself. It was like, you know, because DNN was extensible from the get-go. You know, it was, it was built on these ideas of extensibility, you know, and being able to plug in your own solutions for things. So there was a rich ecosystem that evolved out of this, I think, uh, how many here remember Snow Covered? Yeah, <laughs> I remember oh, yeah. having one of the first few modules that were out there on Snow Covered. And I miss um, it so much. Back for me, that was the, I, I had developed the, oh, I think I called it advanced HTML editor or something like that, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and that was my claim to fame way back in the day. And, uh, you know, put it out there on the store and, was giving feedback to Bryce Snow, you know, and his brother Egan or e Egan, right? Egan, yeah, Egan, I think it was his name. And uh, great guys, you know, but they built this whole platform, you know, for selling extensions. And there was one kind of competitor in in that space, but th they kind of fizzled out, and Snow Cover kind of won the game, right? Um, but that really was a catalyst for a great deal of e-commerce you know um and and being able to start up companies i mean some some of these you know vendors that are here today uh, they got their start way back then you know man deeps and um easy dnn solutions and uh dnn sharp and you know some of these that we we all know the names that's kind of when it all started was way back then they started building their suite of modules and selling them so it was great it was the, the sky was the limit. You could, you know, if you could dream it up and build it, you know, you could sell it and make a good business out of it, you know, um, whether it's document management or a blog module or whatever, you know, there was opportunity galore. So it was a fun time um, in exploring that, you know, and establishing new businesses and establishing the platform itself. And, you know, along the, along the road though, when things start to grow to a certain point, it, it begins to get a little bit more crazy, right? You know, especially for those that are behind the scenes on the project and, and really kind of managing the project or stewarding projects. I can only imagine some of the conversations Sean Walker must have had back in the day is, you know, of, well, what do we do with this beast that's been, you know, created? And um, it's not like you have complete control, but you kind of, kind of do, you know, um, it was, open source, but it was still, there had to been talks about where do we go, you know, from here as the core team. And, you know, eventually there were other people involved, you know, that were the key players, you know, when it comes into the, the platform itself. And um, they come to this point in the river where they, they got to make a decision. Who are we going to be? What are we going to be when we grow up? You know, and he, the, the choice is not always clear. That left side of the river looks pretty good over there, but I mean, the right side doesn't look too bad either. It's got a few more rocks, but, you know, they both look pretty appealing. And guess what? You can't really see what's beyond the bend up there. You know, you can only see so far uh, on this. And so decisions were made. And the project as a whole, you know, there's a decision to form a corporation, .NET New Corporation. And we even have people here that were employees of .NET New Corporation back in the day and could probably some, tell us some incredible stories of all that. But there was decisions made, you know, to figure out how to build a business around this, but yet still stay true to the, you know, the whole philosophy of the open source there 
So <laughs> what happens in DNA court stays in DNA court. Oh, come on. That's not true. That's not true, Will. You can share some stories with us. Um, so, you know, th those choices were made, right? And um, th th some of the choices were, were are we going to be purely open source? Are we going to go to more of a closed source, but make it freely available? Are we going to become, uh, I think I've heard the term freemium kind of model, you know, where there's this free aspect of the product, but there's also this paid for aspect of the product. And that's ultimately you know, the decision that was made and evolved into, I think the first days was like DNN professional right, you know, came out and uh, eventually became Evoke when it was rebranded, you know, but a suite of modules that sit on top of um, DNA platform and um, modifies it to a certain degree as well and kind of becomes a new product offering, but still has the same underlying, you know, base, uh, code base as DNA. So it's really just kind of both, you know, it sounds like a win-win for everybody, right? Um, that, that, hey, we could build a business off of this and offer some professional services or enterprise level kind of services, but still maintain this project that we love and people use to build their own businesses and, you know, provide services to others. So, you know, be that right or wrong, that's the choices that were made. So then there becomes, you know, the whole funding and, and all that kind of thing and what all that dynamic brings to the to the table uh, for that so eventually things grew and grew and grew right but at some point the open source aspect of it or the free aspects of it starts kind of getting ignored because there's business objectives and there's money that's driving the you know the things that are keeping people's salaries paid and and you know a future for the for the company. So it, it's very hard to maintain you know a interest in all of those aspects, right? Because at the end of the day, it's about keeping the lights on and so forth. So you know some very I'm sure there was some very tough conversations, but it kind of started becoming a ghost town when it came to the actual part of it that was you know the open source aspect of it. You know, and, and I think back to the days, you know, it was out on Coplex, right? And, you know, it was very different than uh, GitHub in the sense that it wasn't quite as easy, you know, to contribute or be a part. It was really kind of like, well, here's the source, you can get it, but there's no easy way for you to contribute to it. So it was this kind of this model, if you weren't a part of the inner circle or having the connections to those, it was very difficult to be a part of the actual code base and really contribute to it. So, you know, many of you probably remember there were there were quite a few years where we were like, um, what's the future, you know, of DNN? Uh, is it dying? You know, <laughs> do we need to switch and and go somewhere else? Do we need to look at other solutions? And I'm sure many of you had those kind of questions too, you know, and it's like, well, what's going on? You know, I mean, what what is an MVP, right? Uh, what, what does that mean anymore? Um, what does what does it mean to be open source? You know, th there were so many questions, right? Well, it eventually evolved into being a, a, you know, and I'm not trying to paint a gloomy picture, but it's it's part of our past, right? This is something that it's hard to talk about strategy of the future without recognizing some of the pain of the past because we want to learn from mistakes and things that, you know, decision points that, you know, we weren't even involved in, but, you know, we, we need to watch out for those kind of things, right? So what happened next? Well, this is my perspective, you know, um, but I'd love to hear your perspective as well. But, you know, to me, community happened. Well, community was always there, you know, there was always this real camaraderie, you know, between the people in the ecosystem. And we had the events, you know, that came together. I've got a banner behind me from DNN World, or what was it? .NET Nuke World in Orlando, 2011. I remember 2011, and I think it was 2012, that was the big kind of corp ran events that were there, and they were fantastic. But I mean, that was like 
that was kind of the pinnacle of, you know, events for us back then, you know, it was, it was, they were different, right? But it was the community and the connections that we all have with each other, you know, the friendships that were built over the years, the, the care about our own products, our, you know, our own offerings, our open source projects, our things that we do for our clients, our projects and things like that, you really kind of connected us all. Plus we kind of genuinely just like each other and like to hang out, right? Real diverse group of people, but you know, there's a, there's quite a few that kind of had this mentality of, well, y'all can talk about DNA and dying all you want to, but yeah, not on my watch, you know, it's just not going to happen. So, you know, there was still this undergirding activity and this care for this, this aspect that's so, so differentiating, I think, with our world, with DNN, from other platforms and communities, it's just, there really is a sense of community. There is that deeper connection beyond just a code base and a tool that we use. So that's really kind of what happened, you know, in, in my perspective is the community just didn't let it die, you know? So ultimately, you know, DNA Corp gets acquired um, by EWS and, you know, that brings in even more uncertainty. It, it, ultimately, it became the best thing that could have happened really uh, for our community and for the platform itself. And it was, it was a bit uncertain even for a couple of years after that happened. I mean, this was Will, I don't know if you're on still or not, but what was it, three years ago, maybe, when the acquisition happened and the leadership team was... Um, I think we're moving on to four, four and a half at this point. Wow, that's crazy. So, like, I remember for the first two years, it's like, yeah, okay, we've established some community ownership, you know, of things and kind of becoming the driving force behind things, but there was still a lot of uncertainty for this co first couple of years, but then it, I think it just started the light bulb. Just, it wasn't a, an instant click on, you know, that happened over the, over time, but ultimately it evolved to, you know what, we, we really are in control of things, you know, not from an egotistical standpoint, but just from a, just from a, Hey, we, we, we do control the destiny in the future of this great platform, the code base. I mean, we weren't sure, right, if we really could control it in the sense of not, you know, really evolving it and taking it somewhere and doing really whatever the community sees fit uh, for things. But I think, you know, over the last, I guess, year and a half or so now, it's become very obvious that that is happening. And there is no dictation happening from the corp side anymore. I mean, they're hardly even involved, you know, and that's due to many reasons, but it's ultimately they really meant what they said, you know, um, Andy Trebo, who's not with them anymore. I mean, he said, listen, you guys are in control of this. Do what you see fit. He actually meant it. <laughs> you know, I think we all just were in such shock it sounded like lip service, but it just wasn't. You actually meant it. So um, we've been enabled, you know, to, to go forward. So, you know, that brings us kind of to now. We have this, oops, I'm in the wrong window. Um, we have this canvas now that's, it's a great starting point. And it, it, it's, it's great to look at it from a starting point perspective because it's like, well, okay, if we really are, control as a community of this project well where do we go from here what do we do with it and i think some really great things have already been happening uh for it and that will continue to happen um for it but i, I say all this to really kind of set the stage for strategy it's like well we can't really talk strategy without understanding all of this and i it kind of amazes me. I guess it's because maybe I'm in the whatever inner circle or, or whatever you want to look at it as where 
I know a lot that I guess a lot of people just don't know, but it still kind of amazes me that there are people that don't understand there is no corp. There is no seeking approval, you know, for changes and stuff that we want to do with the platform. It's really driven by the community, you know, and through the leadership team kind of helps guide that and steward that, but it's ultimately what the greater good, you know, needs uh, for things and that's so it's almost a blank canvas i mean we have some baggage obviously with code that was written or so you know that was architected in a certain way that had we were to do it from scratch we wouldn't have done that way but you know we don't have the resources either you know to do crazy stuff either i mean you know we would if more and more people got involved but really kind of comes down to to us you know as a community to you um and how, how can you impact it? You know, maybe you're not a code slinger, maybe you're a designer or a UX person or something, you know, just there, there's so many different ways to get involved in the project and to impact the, both the product as well as the ecosystem at large. So, you know, I was mentioned in Snow Covered earlier, there's a great opportunity for someone or some group of people out there <laughs> to reestablish that, to rethink that, to reimagine what the commerce might would look like or um, distribution of things might look like in the community because I mean yeah we have the DNN store but we don't have it we don't control that and there's nobody at Corp controlling that either there's some management of it that's happening but that has become you know a kind of a dying proposition you know and I'm not sure of any vendors that are really kind of publishing new things out there. Um, maybe there are, I, I don't know. I, I'm not aware of them if they are. But there's a great opportunity there, you know? So it may not be directly with the platform itself. It may just be, you know, something, something like that that might strike your interest there as a business opportunity. So let me get into just some of the specifics of where things have been going and, and all that. Um, I won't spend a whole lot more time, but I'll go to high level some of the areas that have been being worked on and that are being looked at and considered. Um, there are kind of two main areas that are um, under my purview, I guess, uh, in, in the strategy side of things. And one of those big areas is kind of issue management and how things flow through um, the GitHub or, uh, repo out there for data and platform and associated projects. And there's been um, quite a bit this gone on over the past couple of years there, uh, one of the first things that got um, done on, on that was kind of reworking the whole label system and how issues are kind of managed. And it's, it's really still a work in progress. I, I don't know that we have it perfect, but I think the labeling system is kind of working pretty well when we use it. Um, it helps us to kind of identify what area of the code of an issue might pertain to or areas that it might pertain to, um, what the kind of high level of effort that, that might be involved, um, you know, what the priority of that may be, but there's quite a few labels that are used for those purposes whenever we're able to kind of manage issues as they're coming through. We try our best to assign what we know um, makes sense uh, to some of those. Um, the other area is we, we set up an issue triage project out there. And it's funny because like, I, it makes a lot of sense from a, from a high level. In reality, it, it's hard to manage it, you know, when it goes through. And for those that haven't seen it, I'll kind of switch over to uh, GitHub here for just a second and, and show you. But if you go out to the GitHub project and you go to projects, there's an issue triage project. And some of this is automated um, through here. And you can see that it's kind of working at a high level. It's just that we're missing a few key automation pieces and, and we want to fix some of those through GitHub Actions uh, in the coming months. But um, when an issue gets posted on here, it's supposed to be automatically added to the awaiting triage panel and um, or board or layout, whatever, you know, these are kind of like Kanban boards, if you're familiar with Agile methodologies, but it kind of takes them through statuses. And when an issue um, is 
needing more clarity, it gets put into the awaiting either compliance, like if it's not really enough information to be actionable, or it needs some confirmation from others that that is indeed an issue or not an issue. It kind of goes into here um, when it ultimately um, gets recognized as a viable issue that's actionable, it'll go into bugs and enhancements or features uh, column. And then once a PR or pull request is, is submitted for it and closes the issue, then it goes into close. So you can see from the numbers here, it's, I mean, it's working at a high level. We don't do a whole lot of manual management of this. Most of it's automated um, through here, but it's a nice way to come out here and at least see what's available to work on. So like if you're a developer looking for a few things to, to work on, you can use the label system to kind of find the right areas that are your areas of expertise. Um, or you uh, <laughs> go through, um, what was I saying? Oh yeah. Um, or, you know, kind of just look and see, okay, I want to squash some bugs today, or I want to do some enhancements. You can kind of browse through these. Right now there's 40 bugs in here, 14 enhancements and eight feature kind of things. Features are probably bigger, kind of more epics um, that are being worked on uh, for that. But yeah, it's a great way to at least view things. And uh, so I'll jump back over here. But um, the other thing is, well, no, let me go back over here. Another thing is milestones. That was a recent change uh, that we made because it, there was a bit of misperception that was happening with milestones. A lot of times we would assign it to the next patch release or um, minor release, and it was being perceived that that was a commitment that it was going to be in that release. And we switched things up a little bit because that was never really the intent. You know, it was like, okay, if somebody submits, a, you know, a fix for that or a uh, an enhancement for that, then it would get there, but it wasn't a commitment from this, you know, corporate team, you know, that was committing to actually doing it for that release. So if it didn't get done, then it the rock just kind of got kicked down the road a bit uh, on that and was, you know, just pushed forward the thing. So it was kind of frustrating for some people that were thinking it were coming in that particular release and um, ended up not, uh, uh, getting there. Um, so we switched it over to use this kind of naming convention here where we've got a future patch, future minor, and future major. So it puts it in these buckets, you know, and this is another great way to come out here and see what's, see what's, you know, available uh, to be worked on, you know, out here. So there's, you can look in the patch ones, say, okay, well, and what this means is like, there's some explanations on these, but it's like, well, if a pull request came in for this, we would allow that in a patch release because it's not a breaking change. So it's kind of looking at semantic versioning a bit and really following those rules a bit and putting these issues into buckets that we believe make sense uh, for pull requests to come in for those. So it's a great way to look at things and it also doesn't commit to that particular release um, for that. So it's, it, it definitely has helped with the perception because I haven't heard as many complaints, you know, <laughs> about things there. So that's uh, one area that things have, uh, improved a bit on the issue side of things. There's lots that can be done, but as you can see, our number of issues have actually gone down significantly. I think when we first started this process, Daniel, you might be able to correct me if I'm wrong here, but there were close to 350 issues in the backlog when we first kind of started this process. And I think some of the right. organization has attributed to it being able to be flowed a little bit better through here and really kind of squash those down. But uh, thanks to all the, the get approvers that, that go through here and manage these things. And Daniel, I know you do a lot of work to kind of help organize things and validate things and have conversations with people and, and so forth. And just appreciate everybody's effort on that. I think it's working, but we definitely have areas for improvement here. Moving on in, there's a few GitHub beta features that we're looking at, uh, one of which I'm, I'm excited about this, this coming up, and I think Brian had pointed this one out to the team here, but the, there's a way to, to now, once they approve us for the beta, um, we should be able to break issues into individual tasks. So some issues come in that are a little bit bigger than a single actionable item. And this has always kind of been a, 
uh, kind of a complaint, you know, for, for us, because it's like people are reporting the issue, which is great, but it's like, what do we do about it? It's not one thing that needs to be fixed there. It may be five things that need to be fixed related to that issue. So um, theoretically, this is going to allow us to break some of the issues down into individual tasks, but still associated with uh, the issue and really kind of track the relationships as it goes through there, as well as the ability to add custom fields uh, for various things. I'm really excited about that one because that could really be very beneficial for some automation and so forth that we could potentially uh, use with these. So that's one area um, that kind of excited to, to look into and help a little bit more with automation. Can't automate everything, obviously, but the more we can automate that is, you know, more manual, menial kind of tasks would be great. So that's kind of the focus there. So the other of the two areas that I that kind of falls under my purview is some special projects. And this has a, a quite a bit of work that needs to be done in this area too, to be a little bit more intentional about this. Um, sometimes special projects are a bit rogue in nature and individual driven, which is, is, is fine. Um, but sometimes that leads to a little bit of frustration too. If somebody spends a lot of time working on something that they think is gonna be great, but yet the greater, you know, community or the team doesn't really feel that that's the right direction or the right way to do something, it can lead to some frustration. So what I want to kind of do is put a little bit more structure around this, a little more intent in this and try to help people to think through their projects a bit better, you know, and to really kind of think about the greater aspect of things sometimes than, than just be, you know, working in a rogue fashion. So um, a few that I just put in here just to point out some more recent kind of special projects. One is Peter Donker recently um, did some uh, pull requests related to bringing back the whole update feature um, in the data platform. So that was nice to see uh, that come in. So now if you, um, starting with 9.10.0, you should be able to see when there's a, an update available in the platform and be able to access that. So that's really good stuff. Um, Daniel Velatis and I worked on uh, some new concepts that are kind of like precursors to some of the future stuff for DNN 10, but is actually, this stuff is actually going to be available in 9.10.0 that gives you some extend extendability from a theming perspective and styling perspective as it relates to the persona bar and edit bar. So now they have the concept of theming. So be doing a few videos here about that, but they leverage CSS variables. And it's kind of cool because you can just sit there in the browser and kind of play around with the colors and it automatically changes right away. And you can see, oh, okay. So if I put this special file in a certain place or one of these two files in a special place, it'll just automatically update the theme. Um, the persona bar theme, I'm sorry, and the edit bar theme. Um, and these are kind of in a separate world, right, from the site itself. So this opens up possibilities for, let's just say you're an agency and you kind of want to put a, a stamp of your own kind of look and feel for your all your instances um, for clients. You could do your color scheme uh, for the persona bar and edit bar, as well as you can actually even replace the DNN logo using this theme theming. So you could, in essence, you know, kind of brand it uh, as your, your tool is there. So that's a, a great possibility that's coming here in 9.10.0. Another area I think Daniel could speak for hours on this, but is uh, working a lot on some web components capabilities that are potentially coming into version 10. Uh, he has a project out there on GitHub called DNN Elements, as well as another fork that's kind of integration within DNN and how that's perceived. So that's really nice to, to see coming in um, and web components bring out a more standards-based approach to, to components within DNN rather than being tied to like Telric and some of the you know, React components or um, other types of components that would be in there. So that's really nice to see. Some talk has been happening on granular permissions, more granular permissions in DNN. Um, this gives a bit more flexibility for those that are, you know, potentially looking at whether or not they um, want some of the more advanced features like that are currently in Evoke. 
Um, so this might bring some possibilities in that area. Um, just kind of more at a upfront kind of talking about it stage on this. This is not meant to be perceived as a commitment <laughs> for these things, but uh, just some of the stuff that's been in conversation. Structured content is another one just kind of keeps coming up and the need for some basic structured content capabilities within DNN. Not sure if this one will really become, you know, fruition or not, bring to fruition or not, but uh, we'll, we'll see kind of where it goes, but there's definitely some interest in that. And I'm just realizing what time it is. I'm gonna kind of roll things along a little bit here quicker. Um, another special project, it's really outside of the platform itself, um, but I wanted to talk about it a little bit, DNN Docs, because um, some changes have happened there recently. Uh, under new leadership uh, for that team, just uh, due to some personal things that are going on and everything for, for Kelly, um, he's still involved at some level on everything, but um, uh, leadership is, has been shifted over to me and a forming a new team uh, for that. So we're kind of at the beginning stages of the team. Um, Jeremy Ferentz, I think is on here as well. Um, he's going to be joining a bit on this and trying to help us move that project forward. And Daniel Vladis, I think you're gonna help a little bit on this too. We'll be expanding the team out a little bit more as we get further along, but some of the initial things that we're doing is really getting some of the infrastructure uh, changed on this. Uh, one of which is the hosting. It's currently hosted on um, AWS and um, that's in a personal or business account over there. So we really need to get that into more of an open kind of area. So we'll be shifting DNN docs to be over on GitHub pages. Um, it just kind of makes sense. It's free and it's available. It's easy to integrate with GitHub Actions as our CI CD process, build process. Um, that is currently being managed in Jenkins. So we got to kind of transmit, transition that over to GitHub Actions, which should be fairly straightforward, but that's kind of the work that's being done right now to try to transition us over to GitHub pages. And then there's also, Will, this is just a reminder that you and I need to talk about the domain, but we're thinking about switching this over to a subdomain of dnncommunity.org. We just have to kind of talk through some of the SEO ramifications of that and making sure we're doing that in a way that makes, makes the most sense. And beyond that, that's when we'll kind of look at some of the things that people really care about, <laughs> you know, and the organization of the content out there. There's been a lot of ideas that have been uh, thrown out over time, but let's, we're gonna try to move it a little bit into a better structure moving forward and getting some improvements uh, made there. <laughs> the, um, there's, some things about the um, DNN community org on GitHub, some of the projects that are in there uh, that been kind of thinking about for a while, but just started um, implementing some of it. Uh, wanna, on some of the projects, want to, to implement a more consistent branching strategy across them um, to kind of follow the way that uh, things are done with platform. Not quite as, complicated as that, but, uh, you know, kind of basic stuff. A lot of them still have the default branch out there as master, but they may have a development branch or a develop branch, and it's not the default, and it's confusing as to what is the released version and all that. So kind of want to get all that a little bit more cleaned up and start implementing some of the documentation stuff that we, gosh, that was a long time ago, Daniel, that you and I worked on that Jekyll theme. Uh, for it, but that's a great solution still uh, for any of those projects that want to have documentation on GitHub pages um, that leverages a theme that was built that is nice and branded for the DNA community. And then also just recently did a graphic for the uh, newsletter module, and I want to kind of do the same thing to give a little bit more branded look to all the other uh, core modules is kind of the first step on that one, but may include some of the other ones as well. The community website, there's um, some things to be done there. Um, a lot of this is, I'll, I'll cover in just a minute. So I figured I'd break it up a little bit with a nice little uh, cartoon here uh, of Dilbert. 
uh, talking about kind of, you know, change and how things are, <laughs> are done, but uh, you can take a look at that. In the Dean and community, a lot of times uh, things will happen, you know, or a conversation will spawn and there's, there's these cyclical conversations that we have every so often, you know, whether it's reminiscent about old programming languages or if it's about some hotspot feature like structured content or something in DNN and it, it very quickly heads into this chaotic state, you know, of, oh my gosh, we, could we ever be on the same page uh, with any of this, you know, um, it's fun when we're reminiscing about old programming languages, but when it gets into the actual functionality of something that's a hot spot in the in the platform, it can become a debate, you know, whether it's talking about frameworks versus no frameworks or structured content or, you know, just one of these bigger areas, I guess, that are more philosophical in nature, you know, or UX driven, and everybody has their own opinions. And those opinions are valued. But how in the world do we, you know, take all of that and produce something that's, that's good out of that, you know, because a lot of times those conversations will happen. And there's some good debate there. But in the end, well, what do we do about it? You know, nothing really gets done. So part of what I see my role in here is to kind of organize the chaos a little bit, find the little nuggets of things that could be um, grasped onto and we could actually do something with that wouldn't upset the world, you know, but would move us forward as a, as a project. So there's been a, a, a project that's been on the back burner for quite some time, but a lot of planning has happened for it. And I have just started working on the actual code for this, but it's the concept of having, most of you are familiar with user voice um, websites, kind of a way to share uh, ideas uh, out there about things that you would like enhancements or new features or something, and then people can vote on them. You can talk about those things and you know, move them through some kind of cycle that ultimately could go into, you know, something that's actionable, you know, or get to a point where something is able to be actually worked on. Um, so uh, looking forward to working on that a little bit, just to give you a glimpse of the wireframe for this. This is early stages, so it's going to probably evolve into something much better uh, moving forward. But if anybody would like to be involved in this project, let me know. Um, this project is being built using one of Daniel's uh, templates out there for module development, and it's using web components. So, you know, from a technical standpoint, it would be kind of fun to have some people learn a little bit more about web components, you know, either during the project or even after the project, once it kind of gets off the ground and running, but you can really see how something like this could be built in a pure standards-based way instead of being um, reliant on various frameworks and so forth. So I'm excited. Vanilla, vanilla. What was that, Daniel? Vanilla. I like oh vanilla. vanilla. Oh, I thought you... <laughs> my my ears heard something completely different. I'm like really? What? <laughs> That's what we're using. Yeah, so um, that that would be a kind of a fun one. Um, you know, the the kind of the takeaway messages that I would like to have here for all of this is that just kind of wrapping it up here is that many hands do make light work. I've used this slide quite a bit um, on my presentations, but I really mean it a lot. Like if, if, if there's some way that you can either report issues or, um, share ideas or help talk through or validate someone else's issues or, um, try to put somebody in their place if they're acting stupid in the community or whatever, you know, um, that you can help with get involved out there. It's not just for coders. Um, but if you are a coder, please consider contributing code here and there for little areas that you could really make a, a big impact. Sometimes a, a slight style tweak or something like that can really make a big difference from the perception um, of something that's been broken for ages, you know. And then also do check out the GitHub sponsors program. It's, it's, it's great. And it, yep, slash sponsors. I think if you put slash somebody's username on the end of it, if they do have sponsors set up on theirs, then that'll That'll give them. So if you want to 
you know, um, motivate someone to work on a feature in DNN or on some other open source project that's in the community, you know, just this is a great way to kind of motivate people sometimes buying a coffee or something or, or five coffees uh, will get a lot of output from that. Um, Cause it's really kind of the principle of the matter that, that, that motivates a lot of us on this. It's not really about the money, but it's kind of neat to when somebody does something like this, you know, and, and send you 25 bucks, you know, to, to encourage you, you know, and say thanks or to help with something that they really want. So it's a great way to do it. So I'll wrap up here and just open it up for any questions. Anything that uh, kind of popped out, I really wasn't able to keep up with the uh, chat. So if I missed something in there, please, uh, please do point it out now. Well, that must've been really, really boring. <laughs> <laughs> Either that or I did a fantastic job, right, DNN Diva? Did you did a fantastic job. <laughs> fantastic job. Yeah. Well, I've been, pay I've been paid to say that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, crap. <laughs> you are? <laughs> Uh-oh. <laughs> oh, I just expect a drink on the, on the next, you know, event that we might eventually meet each other in 10 oh, years or something. <laughs> well, if there aren't any questions or, uh, I mean, I will uh, close this out. Uh, know that there's no real bad ideas. Um, so really, I mean, there can be, I know, Daniel, as I see the look on your face, there can be really bad ideas, but it's all opinionated, right? It's, it, the thing is, if, if an idea comes to mind, it shouldn't be shot down just because it's a bad idea. We'll put it that way. Um, let's throw out the idea because even a bad idea could promote a good idea of someone else. So, you know, it, it's, it's how, we, how we work together. And Yeah, let's know, get all the bad ideas first, you know, so to rule them out. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, the point is, is that, you know, it's, it, it's an open door policy. Um, this is not, um, you know, a leader sitting up here dictating everything that's going on. It, this is really about the community. So any help that you can provide in, in the area of strategy, I am always open to having conversations about it and, you know, learning ways that I could even be better at doing some of this stuff. Or if I'm just really missing the mark in a certain area, please do let me know because I'd, I'd love to be doing what really does serve the greater good in this community. I'll ask a question that could be a discussion about a bad idea is, um, is there any, if the, the DNN store doesn't seem like it's moving forward anymore, is there any talk of someone doing something instead of it? That's a great question, Jeremy. I, I there's been a lot of people that have stated interest in it um i think it ultimately comes down to the perceived economics of it um and whether or not it makes sense you know to invest what it would take to have feature parity i guess with the existing store because you know i mean it, as bad as we may perceive the store it does have a lot of features in it that have grown you know that would kind of be would be expected out of the gate um, unless somebody just rethought the whole thing, right? You know, and just took a completely different approach, which may be the smart way to do it. Um, yeah, and that's that's kind of what stymied me as I've been given the impression that there's a lot that's been built and customized that would be a lot of effort to reproduce that's not normally in other e-commerce systems. Yeah, and you know, and just because something is a certain way doesn't mean that that's the way it should be. Um, you know, that's that's my perspective mm -hmm. on it. You know, that just because we have feature X doesn't mean that it has to be there. Um, so, like, you know, I guess one of the main you know things is the notification feature. I think they call it Ion or Instant uh, Order Notification uh, that's in there that a lot of vendors in the past used to help trigger licensing to be issued from their own systems for for extensions so that's probably one of the hot ones there's probably a ton of others that i'm just not thinking of right now you know but um the, i think the opportunity well, right away me, 
you can you can immediately realize that me and Aaron both think that that would be easy to build and too sexy. Well, there you go. Then there's a huge opportunity uh, for you guys, <laughs> and I look forward to the announcement of the. Let me see the. the very many Did Will just post that face palm? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, it, nice. you know, we, okay. I mean, who knows? Um, I mean, I think build the <laughs> intention and hope that that Corp will launch this, you know, mysterious new store uh, that's been in the works for several years. But I just... Coming next quarter. I mean, next quarter. Yeah, exactly. I mean, next quarter. So, I mean it, you know, <laughs> I, in situations like this, it's like, yeah, you want to think the best, you know, but I just don't see it happening, right? You know, it may. I may be proven wrong. I hope I am proven wrong, but um, I, my guess is, is that it won't evolve into anything uh, there because there's just not the resources to to implement that. But there's a great opportunity for someone. So yeah, for DNN it would be great because I feel other CMS platforms, you know, that's what entices people to to adopt them to see what's available. I feel like yeah, ours has been stagnating a while. Yeah, it really has, uh, Alex, because uh, like I, I know I still have conversations with uh, some clients and they're, they're like, hey, we found this cool, you know, uh, module that we want to put on the site, you know, and I go and look at it, I'm like, oh, that module. Uh, no, you can't install that, you know, on your site. Um, that's not going to work, you know, uh, either because of security issues or because it's so old, it won't even function, you know, or it has some old dependency, you know, it's, that's a common frequent conversation that I, that I have with some of them. And uh, it's sad because there needs to be a purging that goes on, you know, <laughs> for a lot of those and really to help promote the platform as well and upgrades and people being on the latest and greatest because you just should. And um, I think the store plays a key role in that, unfortunately, in prohibiting people or giving them the perception that they don't have to upgrade. Yeah, sorry, I digress. Uh, I could easily go off onto a tangent there. I started it my fault. <laughs> well, it's a, I mean, it's a big area. It's, a, it's not an area of opportunity, but it's not trivial, right? So I think mm -hmm. anybody that would will, be willing to roll up their sleeves and do something on that would be great. You know, as a community, there is no organization that could really own that and funnel money through. So it's just not it would have to probably be a business venture by someone, you know, to, to be able to, to do that and be able to collect money and be able to manage all of that and not, yeah, it gets complicated. <laughs> if I could put all my clients on hold for a year and be guaranteed to make money, I would consider it. There you go. The guarantee is the part, hard part, right? <laughs> it's like, yeah. it's, it's almost like a net new, even though there's a store out there, you'd have to somehow get vendors that now, sell on their own sites and probably will never go to another platform like that. I mean, you know, how do you attract enough to make, make enough yeah, money? Right? Hard. Yep. There's times where I wish the store would just be shut down, you know, so that we could just move forward without it for a while and everybody could do their own thing. <laughs> Well, thanks everybody. I really appreciate it. Um, I'll go ahead and stop my, well, no, I'll switch back over to this and introduce our next uh, speaker for the day. And Daniel, I'm sorry if I spoke too long here and didn't give you enough time, but. Uh, no, no, you gave me some ideas actually. So. You gave uh, me time to prepare my presentation. <laughs> <laughs> nice. well next we have uh daniel Vladis who's nice. going to talk a little bit about ice cream so uh daniel i'm not going to go into a, a crazy introduction here i'm just going to pass it over to you and let you rock and roll perfect um um you guys see my screen we do the right one i see github profile okay perfect I don't have the green border I usually get. So my name is uh, Daniel Veladis. I'm in uh, Canada. Um, I've been doing DNN development. I started more as an integrator, you know, building a couple websites and I needed some sort of content management system. And um, one of the sites I had to build was uh, e-commerce with a very special requirement for taxes and um, localization. 
And back in the day, the, the, the only solution I found that worked was Catalog. And because of Catalog, I needed DNN. That's how I got into DNN. And I was more of an integrator than anything else back then, although I was doing development, but not for web. And with the years, I started doing more uh, web development and I, I fell in love with DNN. And I've been doing this since uh, I think uh, DNN 4 or something. And uh, I've been loving the platform. Um, within DNN, I'm part of the technology advisory group. Um, my um, Responsibilities include the release management, uh, code review when people submit code. Um, I help review that and other little things here and there, but mainly I've been known for the guy who publishes the releases. <laughs> um, I was always very active in DNN, but like David said, we have some history where at some point it was very hard to contribute. And I was very active, but you wouldn't see my name that much. I became more known uh, when I picked up on the core modules project. Uh, so those modules used to be part of the platform. And uh, at some point they were uh, severed, right? They're not dead. They're just not part of the platform out of the box. So you need to install them separately. And um, when DNN 9.2 came up, there was a lot of breaking changes and most of those modules stopped working and would actually prevent people from upgrading in a day and age where everybody wanted to upgrade because of multiple security issues and because of multiple news events about security, people are more sensitive to uh, maintaining software in general. And a lot of people were blocked because they had a lot of content relying on those core modules. So I became a bit more known in the community, picking up those modules and just revamping them enough so people can upgrade to help keep DNN alive. Because I was not seeing a bright future for DNN. And since then, I do see a very bright future. Uh, contributions have been coming in from people we never saw. Um, the, the community is growing. I'm very happy where we're heading. So that's my introduction. Now, today's talk, and David has been talking about ice cream, but I don't have any ice cream. Uh, <laughs> I'm also known for those who know me a bit more um, on a day-to-day -day basis, the, the guy that hates frameworks. And it's not I hate frameworks. It is I try to not use frameworks unless I really need to. So I'm trying to do plain JavaScript, plain CSS. I'm always trying to go the W3C standard way of doing things before I get a framework. And I will use jQuery if I need to. I will use React if I need to, but I don't start there, right? I'm gonna try to go vanilla and when I get to the point where I need a framework, I'll get it. The reason for that is that I have some experience and I know how upgrades go. I know how dependencies don't age well. So you rely on a project that becomes unmaintained or on a project that has breaking changes in it and you need to upgrade your stuff, but you're gonna break everything. So it's very, very easy no matter what we're talking, we're talking JavaScript or C Sharp or .NET or even CSS frameworks, it's very easy to adopt something that you didn't write to get your work done quick and to learn that framework. And multiple years in the future, all your content was built for this and there's some breaking change and you just have to restart everything, right? So that, that's why I'm... I frown upon frameworks. I will use Bootstrap sometimes when it makes sense and when the, the client is a bit more knowledgeable or integrator, familiar with Bootstrap, well, okay, you twist my arm, I'll put it. But if I'm the one making the decisions, I try to go as plain as I can uh, for those reasons. So that's why the talk is called I Like Vanilla. 
say. So I'm going to be talking about a, a new template. So what you see here is my uh, GitHub page. By the way, what um, David was saying, it's a sponsor slash the username. If you want to sponsor anything DNN related, uh, I am set up for sponsorships, either monthly or one time. And it's very appreciated. I would like to thank all my current sponsors. Um, if you go to my page, you're gonna see another uh, organization repo called Arrowware. And in here, well, the, the most recent is the minimal theme. So the goals of this theme is to be minimal, just what you need. You have all the search, language, picker, everything you need, but it's minimal. So you have your frames, you have your colors, you don't have like a ton of, um, helpers and stuff like you would find in most of the commercial skins out there. Those things are great, but the team in DNN is very often the biggest culprit for bad performance. So I wanna start with a clean team, the best performance possible, still having all the DNN features in it, and you build up on that if you need more than that. Same philosophy as I go with frameworks. So you have something that works, it's clean, it's fine, you want more, you add to it. Um, and this is, by the way, a template repository. So if you come here, and I will put the link in the chat, um, boom, just in case. So it's a template repository. So if you wanna build your own team for your own client, it's MIT license, you're free to use it, uh, you wouldn't fork it, right? You would fork it if you would want to submit a code change to this repository. And it's explained a little bit here. Uh, if you wanna use it for your own things, well, you will create a, your own repository for that. So you would click the use this template and then you give it the name you want. So in this case, I'm gonna call it SF demo for South and Fright demo. Um, SF demo team. And you can even take this and make it a private repository if it's for like commercial work or something you don't want to expose publicly. And I really um, think you should use yep. the recommended name for the repo there. Psychic Rotary Phone. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's great though. I love this new feature, <laughs> but I'm going to go with this. <laughs> um, so this will create you a repository with the name you gave it. It's gonna show that was was generated from here, but it's totally free from the original where it came from. So it's different a little bit than a fork. And um, the first thing you'll notice, this theme is already set up to build in the cloud. So if you have a GitHub account, even a free account, you will see this yellow dot here. And if you click on details, it is building the theme right now on GitHub. So you have nothing to set up, it's ready to go. And it will give you an artifact with your team built zip that you can install directly in DNN. So out of the box, you could use the team as is. Uh, but it's not the goal. The goal is to make your own thing. So I will grab this and um, I'll open up uh, PowerShell or your tool of choice. Uh, and I'll just go to my websites, um, SF demo that I installed, uh, eh? SF demo, okay. Uh, website that I installed with NV Quick Team, a tool I highly recommend you, but to save time, I did it before. And this is running on 9.10. Um, and if time providing, I'll show the persona bar customizations also that David mentioned. So the team is built, it's in the documentation there, but it's built to go in the portals default folder. So I need to CD into portals and default, and I will do a git clone to my repository here. And I will open this in VS Code or your tooling of choice. Uh, of course, you wanna say that you trust me, I hope so. That's new in uh, the latest release of VS Code. 
And I already opened the wrong one. I need to CD into uh, CD uh, SF demo code dot. So the folder we have here in portal default, this is the folder where we're gonna build. The build system would automatically distribute the files in the wrong place. That's why it's relying on living in that place. There are settings you can change here if you have a different workflow of where you wanna locate your files, but out of the box, that's what it's assuming. And you'll see a lot of config files here and stuff. That's all to configure the build and stuff like this. Most of what you're gonna be editing is gonna be in the source folder right here. And it's also in the documentation uh, right here, but you will need a tool called Yarn. Um, for now, I plan to remove Yarn, but basically if you don't have Yarn, you need to go to the Yarn website, which I mentioned somewhere. You need to go to the Yarn website and install Yarn. Once you have that, you could run Yarn install, and that will install all the dependencies. Now, I just mentioned that I'm like the no dependencies guy, but you're gonna see that right now it's downloading Bootstrap and it's huge. Uh, that's because it's an option of the team. So even though it's downloading it, you have the option to take or not take Bootstrap. It's just that I often have clients or integrator that hire me to build a team and they do want Bootstrap. So it's still part of the template but you have a setup option to use it or not. And the same thing for Font Awesome, which is really popular. I have an option to get it or not. So it's pretty easy to get started uh, with or without these things. And in the package JSON, you will see the different uh, Yarn scripts that you can run. Uh, one of them is build, one of them is start, and one of them is settings. So as it says in the documentations, the very next thing you want to do is yarn settings. And this will fire up a little um, wizard to ask you, uh, what do you want to do with this theme, right? So here it's going to be your package name. Uh, it needs to be unique because this uniquely identifies the package within DNN. So I recommend like your company name in it and something like this. You can use dots, just no spaces. Uh, so I'm going to use uh, Southern, Southern Fried DNN Demo Team team for it. And then it's the team name. This is what will show two admins in the DNN UI. I'll call it Demo Team or SF Demo Team. And then in the manifest, you also have the owner of that product and the, the company and email. So I'm just gonna keep these things here. Um, and then you get to the part where it asks you about Bootstrap. So right now it's Bootstrap 4. Uh, I don't plan yet to upgrade it to Bootstrap 5 if any contribution comes in and people are familiar with it. It's a welcome contribution, uh, but I'm not gonna invest time in that unless someone uh, it pays me to get to Bootstrap 5 because I prefer not to use it. Uh, right now with Bootstrap 4, with the team, you have the option of not using Bootstrap at all. You have the option to use part of Bootstrap, which are just the grid utilities, uh, the grid and responsive utilities. So you have the CSS to make your columns. You have the CSS to size your images, to your borders and stuff, but you don't have any components that have um, behaviors that have JavaScript with them. So if you decide to go that route, you have part of Bootstrap and it adds 44K to your team, right? If you want all of Bootstrap, it adds 221K, plus it also means you need Popper JS, plus it also needs you need jQuery. So it, it's a huge dependency. So in this case, I want nothing. I wanna save those 200Ks. Same goes for Font Awesome. I don't want to add it. So you, you could add it or not, but I don't want it. And now the team will build with these settings. Daniel, you are so brave doing stuff like this on a live demo. 
I am. <laughs> well, you know how it goes. Nothing, you know, nothing ever builds right. Or... <laughs> eh, it's fine. Um, so up until yesterday, I had automatic versioning set up and I removed it yesterday because one of the very small dependencies, which is a package called get tag version, stopped working. And I don't know what spend one day fixing that for today's presentation, so I removed that. Uh, I might add something better, but right now, what drives the version for the team is the version you have set in the package JSON here. So I'm going to bring that to 1.0.0 and save it. Next time I build, it's going to be version 1. Um, in the install folder, you're going to have the zip file that you would install in DNN. But if you have a local site, you don't even have to because it's already distributing the files in the right place. So I'm going to go SF demo local test me, which is the URL for the local site I set up for this demo. And it's going to take a little bit to load. Oh, you run a 9.10.0 there? Of course. You always do demos with a beta. Nice. <laughs> So that's another thing about me. I'm always going to use RCs and betas and stuff during development to help test, to try to figure out issues before it becomes a real product. So yeah, here you have uh, what 9.10 will look like. Notice the persona bar colors are different. Everything is the same in the persona bar. It's just the styling. And this is the out of the box uh, team, but you can customize it, time providing, I will show you how. Um, but basically, right now, what we need to do is to go to uh, teams and pick the team we just created. And your mileage may vary, but sometimes you have to go to the home page because the home page has a specific one set. So you need to go here and also change it for the home page. The rest of the site should be fine. But with the DNN templates, the home page come with the set. Okay. So notice the content no is no longer placed right. That's because this content relies on Bootstrap. And I decided to not take Bootstrap. Right, So that's what I mean when a dependency changes and your content relied on those dependencies, well, you have to rewrite everything. So that's why it's usable, but it's not, it's using bootstrap classes to place the things. So now that part stopped working. Um, I will just set up a couple of pages here. Um, uh, add multiple pages. Let's do, let's do, let's do, I don't know, uh, products. And under products, we'll have commercial products. And we'll have resi residential products. Uh, what else? Services. And under that, we'll have uh, support. Um, repairs, uh, parts, let's say, and contact, why not, at pages. So out of the box, you have a menu system that is driven by pure JavaScript. There is no menu library. There is no bootstrap uh, involved. It is responsive. I did some changes yesterday. I hope everything is still fine. It is. So. It's not super fancy menu, but it's responsive. Well, just found a bug. It's responsive and it's very, very, very minimal dependencies. Cool. Now, next step, uh, you wanna do changes to this thing, right? That's the out of box experience, but that's not the colors I want. Very often, um, low budget clients, they will, they will want something simple. You know, I want a menu, I want my logo, I want something in my footer, and here's the colors and my logo, right? They rarely have like very fancy requirements. So one of the things I wanna make really, really easy, and it's part of how the idea came in for this team, I had a client, he has, I think six portals, they all need to use the same logo, 
but in different colors. And he wants a very simple theme, just different um, brand colors on each of the portals. So the idea I got for this client is I'll make you one theme and for each site, you'll customize just the colors. And the way I'm getting there is with CSS variables. So each site will have an override for CSS variables for your primary color, secondary color, uh, light and dark versions of this. And this connects with the plans for DNN 10 to make CSS variables a first class citizen. Um, anybody here show of hands? Well, there, there's not many people showing their faces here, but that attended the um, styles. Uh, what was the name, David? The presentation we did together? Uh, harmonizing styles everywhere, constant yeah, web components, styling everywhere, or something. Yeah, something, something. So it boils down to that uh, kind of idea. So let's get to the theme. One thing I want to do as a developer is to see my changes live. So I'm going to minimize this to about, about we big. And another command that you have in the terminal here would be yarn start. And I'm going to close this window. I don't need this anymore. And here you're going to put the URL where you would see the site. So in my case, it's going to be HTTP uh, sfdemo.localtestdemi. And that automatically opens up a browser window, which I'll try to snap here. Come on. Nah, that was not it. But I will try to snap here. There we go. Um, this fires up a proxy server that under the hood serves your DNN instance under it. Ah, just found another bug. Work in progress. So not, notice the login screen and the colors of it. And we'll get that slightly different. So one thing with the proxy this way is that you don't get the persona bar. I just logged in, so we have the menu because these pages were visible only to admins. And you can also visit your site normally, uh, SF, de SF demo. Uh, on all my sites, I usually disable pop-ups, site settings, site behavior, more. Uh, this is new. I don't know if it's in 9.10 or it was already in 9.9, but you have a UI now to disable pop-ups, which we didn't have until recently. Okay, just so I can show the login without the iframe issue. Um, let's close this. And now this will watch for file changes and it will reload this page after about a second. So I can go on and make changes. So first thing, I wanna change my brand colors. So I'll go into styles and it's a SCSS file, so SAS files. The main file will load DNN things and skin things. One of the things that's done here, we're telling DNN, do not load your default CSS. I will provide it to you. And the DNN folder is basically a repeat of DNN um, default CSS, but a little bit cleaned up and a lot of things that I, I judged deprecated, like they're not used in the platform, I didn't see those classes anywhere, and they're not used by any of the core modules, I moved them into that file. So you have the choice to include it or not. Uh, and in this case, I'm not including it. So that reduces my default CSS by a lot. And there is more coming to the platform. Uh, one of my plans for DNN 10 is to move a lot of things here that are not global, they, they don't load on the default page. Well, they should go into the module where they, they belong. If it's something about login, they should be part of the login module. If it's something about um, social features, they could go, should go in the social module, right? So there's a big cleanup still to make here, but it's gonna be part of platform, not the theme. But here you have a good cleanup and it removes a lot of unused stuff and the, the default CSS makes it really, really shorter. 
And then it also imports DNN variables. So that's the part where the fun begins. Uh, in my DNN CSS, I have set CSS variables consumed by everything here. So if you change DNN color primary, that's gonna change the button colors on all the um, web forms modules, everything that was styled by default CSS as blue now uses this. So I have one place to go change it and it's gonna affect everything that was using the DNN blue. So in my case, let's say the client wanted for his primary, primary color, eh, let me delete this, boom, boom. And I'm just copying from a real client uh, style guide which is kind of the green, yellow nature color palette. Uh, let me just copy a couple of things here. And then you have your secondary color. And then you have your secondary light color. And you have your secondary dark color. And the ones that end with the word contrast, well, they need to be a color that contrasts well over these three, right? Um, also, this one and the normal text color right here is your text color for your paragraphs and stuff. So that's the color they wanted. Um, these CSS variables, note that they are all prefixed with DNN. That's no coincidence. These are the plans for DNN 10. So a team developer putting those values here would affect all of DNN controls also, which is really cool. So you, now you can style your team and also the login and also all the little pop-ups from DNN and stuff to have a consistent styling. Um, module developers, they could also consume those. And it's an opt-in. If you decide to consume that, well, I want my module OK button to use the site primary color. Well, just consume this and you have it. So that's the plan for the NN10 to harmonize the CSS fight between teams and modules and the DNN UI uh, is the way to solve them. So if I just save this, I probably need to open up dev tools to avoid caching issues and just move it out of the way. Uh, but this should have reloaded. There we go. So I just changed those CSS variables and my team is already in the uh, client requirements for brand colors, right? Now, if I decide to log out, um, CTL equals log off, and re-login, my login controls are set. My active element here, border, is in my brand colors. I have highlights for when the, the items are hovered or access through keyboard, same thing, right? So just with this, I already have something that doesn't look like the DNN colors out of the box. Well, that's the uh, general idea with the CSS variables. Um, this is done, this is done. Um, okay, next thing a team developer will do very often is style multiple things. So as part of the team template, so that was styles, uh, scripts, I'm not going to go through this right now in details, but basically Bootstrap is only imported if you picked it in the settings. If not, it's just hanging there. It doesn't get distributed. Uh, there's various utilities here. Well, that's kind of cool. Okay, I'm going to go a little bit through the JavaScript. <laughs> I have a little function called replace classes where you can pass it um, classes that you want to replace with something else. And that also was a requirement by a specific client. Um, and basically they had Font Awesome 4 everywhere and they needed to upgrade to Font Awesome 5, but all their content was using Font Awesome 4. So basically what I've done here is a little method that will get... Um, Those are the old classes, 
and those are the new classes for the equivalent icon between font awesome 4 and font awesome 5. So this is not uh, generated unless you import it, but it's available there. So if you have that situation where you need to upgrade a theme and the content relies on font awesome 4, uh, well, it's there available for you. Uh, another one that I did as a utility was, no, that's the only one I did, Never mind. Uh, the same logic could be done for Bootstrap, let's say three to four. Uh, you could just copy the idea, but use the different class names. For instance, uh, IMG responsive versus IMG fluid or something. There was some breaking changes on a couple of class names. So that's one way to kind of avoid the um, breaking change, still have something that works um, with the old content. And one thing interesting about that method is it will um, show up in the console log, disregard that red thing, that's a Chrome plugin, but it will show for each class it had to replace, it will show which element and you can hover and it's gonna highlight it on the page. So a content editor would see that and say, oh, hold on, I need to go change that one. Hold on, I need to go change that one. So it's a pretty cool feature for team upgrades. Um, that was the script and the other menu TS here. So it's a TypeScript. By the way, for those who might not know, TypeScript is a superscript of JavaScript, a super language, super, eh, whatever. It's compatible with JavaScript, but it's better than JavaScript because it has typings. That's the quick 30 seconds description of TypeScript. But basically my whole menu system is 113 lines, 114 lines, right? So it's pretty basic, simple menu. You can use it with mouse, with keyboard, and it's responsive. Could be improved, but it's, uh, what did I call my team? Basic, not basic, minimal. So it's minimal. <laughs> then in the HTML folder, you actually have your, um, your, your different views for the team, right? So I only have one default ASCX. That's how I go usually unless there's more requirements than this, but you're gonna see one here, tests ASCX.resources. It's renamed .resources on purpose. So DNN doesn't grab it and know that and think that it's a team view. But if I just go and remove the .resources, notice that it rebuilt. And if I go back to the NN, I should keep both opens here. Uh, what was it? SF demo. So that I have my menu. So now that I remove the dot resources, I can go in my, oops. Ah, let's go directly here. Appearance. So now I have tests here. And this is just for the skin developer. Uh, save. Eh. X, let's reload. Boom, you have a bunch of things here. So you're gonna say, well, that doesn't look right. And the reason is these are bootstrap examples and I decided to not get bootstrap. So I'll go in my test ASCX and this loads up includes partials. Uh, no, sorry, sorry, not here. I should have tests somewhere. Test ASCX partials, tests, partials, tests. So the all of these under the test folder are examples of elements in DNN that, that would be styled by default CSS and the likes. So bootstrap ASCX is there just for bootstrap. I don't want this one. So I just want to change uh, tests DNN, tests DNN, and I'm going to remove this line because I don't use bootstrap. Save, reload. Well, it should reload. Okay, so now I don't have the bootstrap stuff anymore. So for a team developer, this is really, really cool because you see how the jQuery resizable plugin, how it's styled. So if you want to change how this thing looks or feels, you could do it. You want to style your login. Well, you have a nice place to test it. You don't have to log in, log off, log in, log off. You have a little thing here. You have any older modules that use the DNN UX UI guide. 
uh, which was, by the way, an idea to get everybody on the same page, which never worked. But you're going to see a lot of modules that do implement this. And I have a little bug with this one for some reason. Well, disregard the bug, but this is where you could style these things, you know, uh, using your team if you want something different. Plain forms, that's how you would test it. The primary, secondary, tertiary buttons. You would see a preview right here. How the, um, the DNN table, we want to style that special way. They go with here. Uh, the info and error messages, those are driven by these CSS variables here with a transparency. So that's how you would customize them and so on and so forth. Um, this is a bad example because it has a menu here, but it's totally unstyled. So disregard the example here, but everything else pretty quick. There's stuff that you do very often, you want to add it to your tests. Well, you can add them here. So uh, it's easy to quickly develop. And when you're done, you just rename back the uh, test ASCX to not distribute it to that resources. And if you do, a bootstrap team, then you don't remove the line I removed and boom, you get all your bootstrap components examples. By the way, part of the build system will apply these variables into the, C the bootstrap colors also, which is pretty cool. Um, uh, test view. Cool. So it's a minimal theme. The goal was performance. Let's see how we do on performance. Ooh. Um, ooh, ooh, performance. Ooh, 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 ooh. So let's uh, change back to our default here and save, right? Uh, I don't need VS Code in the front anymore. So let's go that way. And let's just reload so that we have this. Cool. Now performance, don't do performance test with the proxy because the proxy adds stuff. So it's not a real good test. On your real site, you're gonna do your performance. Another thing to be aware of is if you have Chrome plugins, well, those are counted in the performance. So if you wanna do a real performance test, you would have an incognito window. Now let me copy the URL first. You would do it in an incognito window. Right, and not logged in. We don't want to count the persona bar and all these things, right? It's, we're, we're doing this for visitors. And this is where you would run your tests. So now I'm going to open uh, this. Let me bring that over here. And in Chrome, as in Edge, I think, uh, is it in Edge? Hmm. Well, in Chrome, you have one of the tabs is called Lighthouse. It's the same engine that drives uh, a lot of clients go by uh, Google PageSpeed. It's the same engine. It's just a little tiny bit better because it, it doesn't give you the same, what's a nice word for stupid? Well, stupid opinionated. advice, opinionated <laughs> advice as Google would give you, for instance, complaining about their own scripts performance. So it's a little better I find. So let's try on desktop first. And by the way, I didn't minify anything. So without minification, we're getting 99% performance, which is pretty nice. On desktop, on a mobile, without compression, without minification, without merging the files, we're getting 96, right? That's the worst case scenario, like not, not even a single consideration for performance right now. Now, if we go into the network panel, and we go look at our largest resources here, uh, this way. So the biggest one is jQuery, right? Followed by ASP.NET scripts and followed by the logo. So we don't have a huge dependency. The big one is jQuery. Now, I've said I'm the no dependency guy and I didn't do anything on my team to request jQuery. What's wrong? Well, that's another thing I'd like to improve for the NN10. As soon as you include the search skin object, it has to load jQuery. That's the same reason why I disable pop-ups by default. The pop-ups require jQuery. 
before the pop-up loads. So it's a 20 something K compressed just for jQuery, but then jQuery UI, ah, that's huge. I don't want jQuery UI. We're not even using it. So in order to solve that temporarily, just for the, the sake of the performance test here, I'm going to go and just remove the search skin object. But it's something I plan to do for the NN10 that the search skin object and login don't rely on jQuery. Because I find that jQuery belongs in some places, but stuff like this that, that are part of the team loads on every single request. I don't want jQuery there. It's a huge dependency for no reason. I don't need jQuery to make a dialogue. I don't need jQuery for the search. Um, so in order to disable that, I'm going to go in my HTML uh, partials, not tests, header. And somewhere, somewhere, search. I'm just, I'm just going to kill it for now. We'll do something better. Obviously, if you would be um, doing a real team, um, you might want to consider different things. But right now, I just want this and uh, registers. I don't want to register search. Kill this. Boom. And now, let's do a hard refresh. I, I didn't use the live. Uh, Thing, but if I reload now, my largest resource is script resource, which is the, the well, I'm sorry, no. This is the ASP.NET JavaScript. And then my second biggest thing is the logo. And then I have my team. So my team CSS is 15K, 15.1K. This includes the DNN, the replacement for DNN default CSS, plus everything I have on my team, just 15K. And my team JavaScript, uh, my team JavaScript is 1.8K. All the JavaScript for the menu uh, is included there. Well, I don't have a lot of JavaScript on my team, so it's kind of nice. But if, if you load jQuery just to query elements and stuff, you're, you're loading like, 10 times of a dependency than the code you're writing, it does, just doesn't make sense, you know, just learn vanilla. So um, there's that. Uh, Lighthouse, oh, Lighthouse, okay. So another thing that we should do for a production site would be to go to servers and server settings and performance, and you would, well, adjust the cache and this and that, but I'm more interested in composite files and minification and just increment the version here to be on the safe side. So boom, boom. And now my skin uh, JavaScript and oh, I'm still logged in, log out. This, uh, oh. Now my skin JavaScript is now included in this script resource. They're all bundled together. So with compression, it, it barely grew 0.8K because a lot of these things got compressed together with the rest. So it's really, really, really uh, minimal. And my second largest resource is this logo PNG. So think replace and the CSS, right? All of the CSS is now 12.4K, all the CSS. And, um, my biggest thing now is the logo that I could reduce. And let's choose just that. Uh, let me switch my notes here to this. And let's go um, site settings. And I have a logo here. Um, uh, let's grab some logo here and let's grab out of five icon somewhere here. No, not this. It's going to be here. And this one, bada bing, bada boom. Uh, 
And now if I go to source uh, network, well, my logo went way down there because now my logo is, uh, well, is it that big? Uh, there's text and everything. There's a lot of SVG logos that are gonna be way smaller than this. So bad example, but yeah. Now, obviously this logo is kind of larger and has a lot of text. So you would adjust the theme to have this a bit bigger and stuff. Um, I'm gonna quickly do it from notes because I wanna show another thing that's uh, new in the NN10. How are we on time, David? Oh, we're good. You got about nine minutes. I have nine minutes. Okay. Yeah. If you okay. need more, feel free to have a little bit more. And if people need to drop, they can drop. Uh, we'll keep it recording. Okay, cool. Um, so the logo and the styles uh, in the skin styles. Uh, if anyone is really new here, uh, themes used to be called skins in the NN. So that's why all the developer oriented stuff it's named skin and it was rebranded, renamed team uh, in the UI. So if you see skin or team, it's pretty much the same thing. So my logo is in the header and I have some styles here. So I could make it uh, the minimum width 300 pixels, which will help that. Uh, let me bring this out and bring this side by side. And if I reload, and notice I'm, I'm manually reloading because I have to keep going back and forth in the persona bar here, but usually I would use the live reload uh, performance. Let's disable this during development. Well, I did all this to show you Lighthouse, but basically you get 100-100 with the logo replaced and um, using minification and not having to load jQuery. It was the thing I wanted to show, but you you know what a green 100% uh, looks like, so I'm not going to go back there. Okay, that makes my logo a little bigger. Now, the example I gave you earlier that I had a client who needed multiple portals and just the logo needed to be different colors, right? So I can do this here. However, right now, the logo is loaded as an image. And I don't want that. I want my actual SVG to be right here. And that's a new feature in 9.9, nine, I believe, or 9.10, 9.9, I guess. But you can pass something in your logo, uh, HTML, partials, header, in your logo skin object right here. Let's get this a little bit more visibility. Um, you can add inject SVG. Inject SVG equals true. And what will this will do is instead of loading it as an image tag, it's actually gonna read the content of the SVG and spit it on the page. So if I save this, let it finish building and do a hard refresh here and bring my dev tools here. Well, see, we don't see the logo anymore for one. And two, um, well, okay, it's gonna be easier to fix this first or faster, should I say. Uh, let's go with, 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 with the CSS of the header. So because it's no longer an image, I need to style it differently. So I know that my, um, oh, I forgot a little something, which is to embed this in a div called logo, so I can target it with CSS. Save, let's go back here to header CSS. Okay, so I have my logo div, right? And then for my logo, I have, uh, let me give it, let's use Flexbox and give it a flex basis of 400 pixels. So that means it will try to be 400 pixels if it can. So if you get on a smaller device, it's gonna squish by itself, right? So it's gonna try and be 400. Um, then I'm just gonna copy CSS here just in the spirit of saving some time. Why can't I? 
get here. Um, 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 do I have anything? Huh, my mouse is locked. I can't get to that. Why? Hey. Okay, now it's going. Hey? <laughs> okay, I'm just going to copy a piece of CSS that I have already done yesterday because I. Boom. So now what I'm doing is I'm getting, I know that my SVG code, right, my SVG element has an ID of logo. And in there I have class one for some reason. I just grabbed the SVG from somewhere, so I didn't write it. Uh, but I know that the thing I want to color as class one and the text part as text and class four. And when we hover, and this is a very, very bad example, it should be on hover or um, active. Always. Uh, not active, focus. Sorry. Because if you go by keyboard to navigate to this thing, it's going to be focused. If you go by mouse, it's going to be hovered. So people who always think on hover, try to think together, hover and focus. It's If you're using the keyboard, you're focused. You're not hovering. And same goes for mobile devices. There's no hover on mobile. So if I reload here, I should see a logo with colors. I said, loading browsers. Uh, eh? Finally, the demo gods showed up. Line two, main CSS. CSS is expected. I have some invalid CSS. Copy paste. We'll get you there. This is here. This is there. This is there. And focus. Um, I am missing, I think, this. There we go. Boom. Mm -hmm. So now I have my brand colors here. Right? Pretty cool. So now you know how each site has uh, custom CSS, right? So I could just redefine my brand colors per site and be using the same theme for all my sites, which is pretty cool for a multi-site single client that needs different styles for sales and support. Uh, they have different subdomains or stuff like this. Or for clients that they just want a site running, they don't have crazy needs for a team. So you put a logo, you style it, put the brand colors, boom, you have a team working. As future comes, they want to invest on the team. Well, you expand upon it, but you have something nice with high performance out of the box. Uh, this, talked about this, talked about this. I am done with my talk. Now, questions or demo of the persona bar? Questions is X minutes, demo of the persona bar is five minutes because I have it ready. Yeah, for the ready one. Okay, so persona bar, what was done by uh, Mr. David Poindexter here was a uh, restyle of this thing. And then we came out with the idea of it's cool, but why not make it customizable and maybe even white labelable? See, I can invent words too. That's pretty good. <laughs> white labelable. So let me get um, on the site and show you how it's done. It's part of the PR, and I think it's part of the NN Docs. Is it? No, not yet. Not yet? Okay. It will be. Okay, cool. Um, so it's SF demo. Now, right now, word of advice, this is for hosts. So if you change it, it's changed for all the sites. Okay. Now, in your DNN instance, you need to go to portals. And because it's not for any specific portal, but it's for the, the host or the super user, or the instance, then it's in portal default. I prepared the files in advance here, but basically 
you would copy uh, from the desktop modules admin uh, persona bar and edit bar, you would copy the team CSS and put them here as edit bar team CSS or persona bar team CSS. I named that resources so they don't apply. Now, if I just renamed it CSS, and reload the site and boom i have a totally new um, color scheme and i still have like all my men is working fine and the edit bar as that theme also and you can even change the logo now i did this very quickly as david was doing his presentation when he mentioned this <laughs> so i didn't take the time to find a nice logo and everything and it's black so it's kind of strange but that's the overall idea so you can even replace your logo right now what i have here is like really really basic and i'm just redefining the colors however it's not limited to that if you want to totally change everything you have access it's a css file that loads with the persona bar so you could go and change and make everything totally different but right now i'm just like redefining the colors to match the branding guidelines that client x provided me and maybe in the NN10 time providing, well, the modules here, those components and those buttons will match with also the, um, the brand guide. That's plans for um, the consistent, ah, that was the name of our talk, consistent styling everywhere. So eventually this will consume the CSS variables we, we just defined. And that's pretty much it. Any questions? Yeah, Daniel, you could probably just do an inspect there and show them where they can grab that the that CSS so that it's not all magic. Oh, totally. Um, um, it's on the web. Oops. You can copy a website. Um, I just mean in the in the browser inspection. You know, the oh tools. yeah, sure. Uh, you can see where the CSS variables are injected uh, for mm -hmm. the persona bar. And then if you open the edit bar, you can see that as well. So, Boom. and you can really just okay. copy it from here and place it into a file that's named like he named them. And uh, exactly. Uh, not this one. Not that one. Not, not main, not main, not main, not main, main. All the way down to the bottom. Really? Yeah. Right there. Oh, no. Yeah. There we go. So if you don't have that file, it's going to show the one that comes out of the box in the, in the desktop modules folder. But if you put the file, that's what the things you're going to need to define are these colors. And that's kind of a great way to test your theme as well. Oh, yeah. So that way you can just change those values. Right and totally there. play with it well. right here. Yeah. Um, let's go with work this out one. Your whole design there and then place it into yeah. a custom file. And then the same is true for the edit bar. Whenever it's shown, yep. it'll inject those there as well. So, oh, this is perfect. Purple and green. That's a nice. <laughs> That's pretty. <laughs> yep. So, other than that, everybody fell asleep. <laughs> oh, this is a really good uh, presentation there, Daniel. I'd love to see how you did things in such a vanilla way. Yeah, cool yep. stuff. And it's open source. You have ideas, you know, as long as they go with the philosophy of the team, you know, like don't start sending all kind of dependencies and you find a way to improve something that uh, benefits the greater good. Well, contribution, contributions are welcome. Uh, one of the things, there's a couple of open issues if anybody feels like tackling this anybody has experience with bootstrap 5 and wants to grab a bite at this thing and just needs help with you know how should i do this and stuff like ping me up um still looking for a better way to manage automatic versioning to replace that failing thing and um i want to remove yarn in favor of npm because really we don't need yarn here and npm comes out of the box with node.js so that's things I have in my um, backlog. 
But if you find any issues, like I found the little uh, dialogue things were misaligned or, you know, you use this theme and you do some fix for your own work and you want to contribute back to fix, uh, contributions are welcome. Excellent. Well, thanks, Daniel, for, for doing this. Uh, I think that's very helpful for you are welcome. these tools. It's great to have options out there on how to approach this stuff. And this is a really good standards way of approaching this whole thing. So thanks for presenting. Well, we'll, uh, we'll wrap up the recording piece of this. Thanks for everybody for joining and uh, feel free to hang out after the recording if you want, uh, if you have uh, things that don't need to be said on air. <laughs> but we'll go ahead and stop recording. Thanks for joining us. And next month, um, I think we have on the docket, Mitch Sellers uh, presenting on uh, the technology uh, group and things that are going on there. And I'm looking to see who is joining him. Uh, that will be, if I could get to the right page here, Chris Hammond is actually going to join us. We don't know what he's speaking about yet, but uh, it'll be nice to hear from Chris Hammond. Chris Talk, as many of you know him, uh, will be joining us. So that'll be on Thursday, October the 19th, and we will go back to our evening schedule here on the East Coast, which is a 6.30 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time. So uh, looking forward to that. Be sure to register out on the Meetup uh, site if you haven't already and get that on your calendar. I'll go ahead and end the recording and thanks for joining everybody.